Thank you for joining our Torah class, which is on the portion of Akev, which can be found in your Blue Ox Krochamish. If you're following in the Blue Ox Krochamish on page 980, and any other Chomish, it's the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 12. Um, if anyone's comfortable putting on their camera, it would great to, be great to see you. If not, you're fine the way you are. So this is a very, very exciting Torah portion. Remember, we're still in the middle of Moshe Rabbeinu's final address to the Jewish people in the last 36 days of his life. And it's beautifully uh, rich and inspiring with guidance and love for the Jewish people. There's much to be said, but we'll try to at least touch on some of the uh, beautiful uh, messages of this week's Torah portion. So the first thing we'll do is start with the actual name of the Torah portion, because that's a very, very um, famous Rashi commentary on the very first verse uh, based on the Midrash. So the name of the Torah portion is Akev. In this context, the word Akev means it will come about because you will listen to the commandments of God, that God will keep his covenant and his chesed, which we'll discuss in a minute, that he promised to your ancestors. So in the English translation, says, this shall be the result or the reward uh, when you listen. So Akev means the result, because, the outcome, the reward of following the commandments. But we all know back from the story of Jacob and Esau that Jacob was called Jacob because he was grasping the heel of his brother Esau. And he was called Yaakov because the word Akev, which is in the word name Yaakov, means the heel. He was a heel grabber. So what does this have to do with the commandments? It could have said, Vahaya im tishmun, if you will listen to the commandments, or kasher, when you will listen. It uses a very unique word, akev. So what's the connection between a heel and listening to the commandments? So in Perkei Avot, it says that you should treat all mitzvahs equally. You know, all men were created equal. Well, we say the same thing about mitzvot. All mitzvot were created equal. Because when you really think about it, what's the greatness of the mitzvah? Of course, there's the deed you're doing. But even beyond that, the word mitzvah, which means commandment, also means safsa, which means connection. Which means that every mitzvah creates a connection with God. And that's the most rewarding part of every mitzvah, that you're connecting with God. You, a finite, limited human being in a body, could create connect with the most, with the infinite being, Almighty God, what could be greater than that? And so, Pirkei Avot says that you should not weigh the mitzvot and say this is a major mitzvah, this is a minor mitzvah, but as we say, you should major in the minors, meaning treat the minors as though they're ma majors, because you really don't know the reward for mitzvot. One of the things the Torah does not do is, the Torah sometimes outlines punishments, but the Torah doesn't typically. There is an exception with honoring your father and mother and sending away the mother bird, but that's precisely the point. The hardest commandment is to constantly honor your mother and father properly. The easiest mitzvah is to send away the mother bird, but yet the Torah gives the identical reward, long life. You would have never guessed that something as simple as sending away a mother's bird, which is a one-time easy action and small sacrifice, would be the equivalent in reward to a mitzvah that is a constant commandment of honoring your parents properly. What the Torah is teaching us, as it says in Perki Avot, is that you should treat a minor mitzvah, what you think at least is minor, as though it's a major mitzvah. So the name of the Torah portion is Ekev, which means a heel. And Rashi says it's teaching us that there are certain commandments that people trample upon, they stomp upon, they tread upon with the heel of their foot. Metaphorically, what that means is, I like to give the example of Yom Kippur versus Lashon Hara. You know, most Jews, even if they're not so religious, they fast on Yom Kippur. 
or they go to synagogue in Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, because that's considered a big, important mitzvah. Everyone considers that important. Unless, God forbid, someone is very ill and they can't fast, <clears throat> every Jew fasts on Yom Kippur, surely a religious Jew. But unfortunately, many Jews, and myself included, sometimes uh, stray and speak Lashon Hara negatively about others, gossip, slander, which is worse than gossip, Lashon Hara. And for some reason, maybe because we think it's just words, we're not harming anyone directly with our words, we're just speaking about somebody. But the Torah told us not to speak Lashon Hara, just like it told us to fast in Yom Kippur. So we shouldn't consider one mitzvah greater or more important than the other mitzvah. And that's what Rashi says. Akev teaches us that don't trample with your heel on certain mitzvahs. Keep even the mitzvahs. You know when you get the full reward? When you treat every mitzvah with the utmost significance and importance. Because you never know the true importance or value of a mitzvah. And therefore, be an equal opportunity observer of mitzvot, treat all mitzvot with the same love and dedication. And even if you may think it's so minor, this mitzvah, it's so small, it's so maybe insignificant, but you never know what is really important and what is really significant. And there are many stories that illustrate this, but I'm reminded of a story of a certain rabbi who worked in a slaughterhouse. And he would come in to work every day. And one day he was in a freezer in the back of the uh, slaughterhouse. And by mistake, the door slammed on him and locked him in. He couldn't get out. Something must have been jammed with the door. He couldn't get out. And it was the end of the day and all the workers were leaving. And as much as he was banging on the door, nobody was in the room and nobody heard him. And God forbid, had he spent the night there, he would not have come out alive in the morning. He had no phone. He had nothing he could do. And after about a half hour in the freezing cold freezer, the door opens. And who is it? The security guard of the building. And he saves his life. And when he says to the security guard, how did you know to find me here? You know, you're stationed at the front door of the building. And he said, I'll tell you why. He said, every day, hundreds of people come into this big slaughtering plant to go do their job. And they all walk by me, you know, some say hello, but nobody really connects with me. But you, every day, you give me a big warm smile, you say good morning, you call me by my first name, you ask me how I'm doing. And then when you leave at the end of the day, you give me that same warm smile with that big good evening, have a good night, and you again address me personally. And frankly, I look forward to it every day because you always greet me and you never just walk by me. And so I always look forward to mornings and evenings when you're going to come and go. And when you didn't leave, I said, I noticed and I went looking for you. And that's the way I found you. So something as simple as just being cheerful and good morning and smiling at somebody, at a security guard, you never know. But that's true with all the commandments. So the Torah says, Akev, even the commandments that people uh, stomp, stomp upon and tread upon you should keep. I'm just going to tell you a personal story. You know, there's something called chatnays, not to mix wool and linen garments together. And there's in religious communities called shotness factories, because even if you buy a garment that's 100% wool and there's no linen in it, sometimes the manufacturers will put a little linen around the buttons or around the collar. <laughs> So these shotness laboratories inspect. With, they cut open with a razor. They check if there's any threads. Because biblically, it's a chok. It's a super rational commandment. We're not supposed to mix wool and linen. And who established it? So I remember as a child, like in third grade, this rabbi with a white beard, this is going back in the 70s, came to our classroom and talked to us about the mitzvah of shotness. And I don't remember his name, but he was the founder of the Shantanus Laboratories. And he said the story why he did it. He said he was in the concentration camps and he made a vow to God. If you save my life and I, I survive and I live, I'm going to find the mitzvah that's neglected and I'm going to reinforce it and strengthen it. And so when he lived and survived the Holocaust, he said, you know, Shantanus, people don't, 
yeah, they may be careful to buy a wool suit, not wool and linen, but are they checking properly that there's no threads of linen? So he started these training people how to inspect garments. And that's the way the Shotness Laboratory was established. So especially a misfit that's overlooked, that's neglected sometimes, that's what the word Akev is trying to teach us. But I want to look at the end of the verse, because I think there's a very important message here. It says, Vayakev Tishmon, if you listen, this is the opening verse of the portion. If you listen to the commandments that I am instructing you, and you guard them and you perform them, then God will keep for you, he will safeguard for you, et habrit, the covenant, vet chesed, and the chesed. Now, if I'm looking in the Asko Chamesh, it says the kindness that he swore to our, your forefathers. God will uphold his covenant and his kindness that he promised your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, in the merit of you keeping the commandments. So I just want to look at the word chesed, kindness. What exactly is chesed, kindness? We all know chesed means kindness. We do kindness. But the verse says that we say this every day in our, in our prayers, olam chesed yibana. God built the world through kindness. So what is kindness? So we all know that there is the way to acquire something is through legal rights or acquisition. And then you are legally entitled to whatever you purchased or acquired. But then sometimes you get what is called tzedakah, charity. It's not that you're legally entitled to it, but morally, there's a moral obligation on a person who's blessed with abundance to share some of that abundance with those less fortunate. So that's like a moral obligation. But then there's chesed. Chesed is undeserved kindness. Chesed is when there was no there was no um, prerequisite to your act of chesed. So sometimes chesed is based on something someone did. So I reciprocate with kindness to them because in the past, let's say, they've been kind to me or they've done something for me. So I have a relationship with them. So therefore, I will now do chesed with them. But true chesed is what God did. He created us. You know, there's nothing in the world we could have done to earn or deserve or be entitled in any way the gift of being born, created, and being alive. So chesed is when we do with others what Hashem does with us. That even if somebody hasn't done anything to be deserving of this kindness, I do chesed with them. And that's why many times in English, the word Kindness is not the right translation because there's a lot of acts of kindness that we do for our friends, for example, right? But that's not true kindness because you have a relationship with them. They're your friend. In the past, they've done things for you. So it, it's understood that you'll do things for them. The real translation of chesed is loving kindness. Loving kindness means that it's kindness that purely comes out of love. It's not just reciprocal kindness. And that's why when we talk about those who volunteer for the Hebra Kadisha, for the Burial Society, we call it uh, Chesed Shel Emes, the truest form of kindness. That's when the story of uh, Abraham telling Eliezer, take a vow and you know, place your hand beneath my thigh, go find a wife for my son Isaac. He says, Vasisim Adi Chesed Vemes, truth and kindness. So just God says, I will perform for you. I will uphold a covenant and perform acts of loving kindness. That's the translation. And then it goes on to uh, list all the blessings that the Jewish people will receive as a result of keeping the commandments of the Torah. Now, there's one more word I want to focus on in this opening verse. We talked about the word Akev. We talked about the word chesed. 
But I want to look at the third word of this parsha. Vahaya ekev tish me'un. When you will listen to the commandments. Now we all know the word tish me'un. We had it last week in the parsha of Etchanan. Shema Yisrael, hero Israel. And in this week's parsha, we're going to have the second paragraph of the Shema, which says, Vaya im shamoa tishmuv. Listen, you will listen to the commandments of God. It's a double expression. So I want to talk a little bit about the idea of listening, because in Judaism, Jonathan Sachs once famously said that most religions are like television. Judaism is like radio. What he meant to say is that in other religions, they have idols and statues, visual representations of their God. In Judaism, we're forbidden to make statues or graven images. We're not supposed to see God because you can't see God. God is infinite. You can see God's garments, which is the universe, but you can't see God, obviously. But what you could do is listen. You could hear. As the prophet says, I'm not in the, the, in the, in the mountain, in the cloud, in the thunder, and the lightning, but in the soft still voice that everyone could hear in their heart and in their soul and in their mind. So we try to tune in to the voice, to the message, to the communication of God. Now, obviously, the whole Torah is the word of Hashem that we're listening. Okay. Now, first of all, I want you to understand that the word listen doesn't just mean to listen with your eardrum. It means to understand. Shema Yisrael doesn't just mean Listen, O Israel, or hear, O Israel. Most English translations, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Now, yes, in English, sometimes you say, I hear you. I hear you is a form of empathy. Like, I hear you, I get you, I understand you. I've internalized it, right? So hear doesn't just mean to hear it, because we hear lots of things every day. question is what we take to heart, what we internalize, what we hold on to, what we truly receive, not just what we hear. So here, and we find this in the Torah as well, when it says when God confused the language of the Tower of Babel, there in, in Breshit, the Torah says, I'll go down and confuse the language so one will not hear his fellow man. It doesn't mean they won't hear each other. Even if someone speaks a different language, <laughs> you hear them, but you don't understand them. So Shema Yisrael, or Ekef Tishma'un, means, and in English there's a word that you sometimes, if you will Hearken to my commandments. Hearken means you will do it. So it's listening with the intention of practicing, acting on what you've heard. So it's not enough, you know, to hear it, but you must do what you've heard, right? So we all hear, like we're gonna we're gonna learn for an hour now. We spoke about not speaking lashon hara, right? Commandments that people stomp upon. But the fact is that the real test is: will we then go out? And hear, meaning listen, understand, obey, observe. So that's the whole idea of listening. And Judaism is very much, you know, Abraham, how did the first relationship with the first Jew begin? God told Abraham, lech lecha, go to the land that I will show you. And the rest is Jewish history. But it begins with a communication, a message. God didn't appear to Abraham. It wasn't a visual thing. It was, Bayomer Hashem, God said, and as God speaks to Abraham, God speaks to every person, every Jew, through the Torah, but also through meditation. We could hear the voices of messages that Hashem is communicating to each and every one of us. So, and the same thing is true in personal relationships, right? You know, we have this expression, seeing is believing, right? That we want to see things. But sometimes this could be optical illusions, Right, people could you could be deceived by what you see. A person could make an appearance to be a very dignified, honorable, respectable person, and it could just be a superficial appearance on the inside. They could be anything but a lot of times we're fooled by our eyes. We see someone that looks attractive, we think they're a beautiful person, really, it's just an external facade. And sometimes you see a person who outwardly doesn't look nice at all or attractive they they could be dressed you know poorly and sloppily or whatever and we may get the impression that they're not a good person they could be the most wonderful person so as they say don't judge a book by its cover so you know a lot of times people say oh it was you know love at first sight well of course there could be a spiritual connection that a person feels but 
if you're judging your love based on what you're seeing, that could be uh, very misleading. What you want to judge is based on what you hear, what the person says, how they think, what they communicate, the way they speak. If you want to understand the relationship, look at the way they speak. People speak to each other. And, and that's the way you learn what that relationship is like, whether it's between parents and children or husbands and wives or friends. It's about listening. That's ultimately what it's all about. So the word Tishmuun in Judaism is a very pivotal word, and we see it in the Shema. Shema Yisrael, v'hayim shema tishmu, if you will listen, if you will hearken, if you will obey. It's about truly hearing what needs to be uh, internalized and heard. Um, I want to jump now to chapter 8 of this week's Torah portion, because this is a huge, huge um, message that Moshe Rabbeinu is sending to the Jewish people. And within chapter 8, there are many, many, many ideas, but what is the overarching message of chapter 8? Moses is not going to go with the Jewish people into the desert, so he's giving them his prophecy. He's for warning them what's going to happen. And he says something absolutely remarkable. You know, when you think about gratitude, which is essential for living a healthy and a happy life, you know, people with gratitude live longer, they're happier, they're more productive, they're more resilient. Studies show mental health, emotional health. Uh, gratitude is the number one indicator of so much Uh in life. And that's why, as you know, the very first word that comes out of our mouth when we awaken is modeh. I give thanks to you, Almighty God. In the Amidah, three times a day, we say modeh manach nalach, we give thanks to you, God. And by the way, even when the cantor rep repeats the Amidah, the congregation is the only prayer that the whole congregation rises and says their own version of gratitude, because you can't outsource gratitude. So gratitude is really essential. But if you think about it, there's something counterintuitive. You would expect that, okay, people, you know, maybe who don't have a lot, or people who have challenges aren't grateful, and they have to be reminded, be grateful, even though you may not have a lot or you may have a lot of challenges, focus on the good and be grateful because there's always something to be grateful for. But you would think that the person who has everything in life, that life is just going swimmingly for that person, surely will be grateful because they have so much to be grateful for. It's so obvious, right? <laughs> so most of says something quite fascinating. And Jewish history has borne this out. He says, you know, you left Egypt, you had a lot of challenges, and you complained along the way about one thing or another. That makes sense. You complained about the food, you complained about the mana, you complained about the water, you complained about all the different things. And you showed a lot of ingratitude. You said, we remember the leeks and the melon and the, the, the cucumbers we ate in Egypt. Okay. But now Moses says there's a new danger. And it's so beautiful. I just want to quoted he says you know you're going to come to the land a good land with rivers and streams and mountains and valleys a land and he lists the seven species of wheat barley grape fig pomegranate the land of all oil olives and date honey a land where you eat bread without poverty you will lack nothing there a land whose stones are iron and from whose mountains you will mine copper and then he gives them the commandment to bless God, you should eat, be satiated, and bless God for the good land that he gave you. However, he shamelocha, be careful. Why? Lest you forget Hashem, your God. Why? Because you will eat and be satisfied, but instead of blessing God, you'll eat, be satisfied, and build good houses and settle, and your cattle and your sheep and goats will increase. And you will increase silver and gold, and everything will increase. And your heart will become haughty, and you will forget Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. And then he goes on to say, You will say in your heart, My strength and my might of my hand made me all this wealth. So what Moshe Benu is saying is, 
<laughs> there is a danger that when you come into the land of Israel, you will be showered with goodness and abundance and prosperity and gold. He says gold and silver. You'll build houses. But you know what's going to happen? The success will cause that your heart will become inflated, haughty, prideful, arrogant, and you'll forget God who gave you all these blessings. And you know what you'll say in your heart? My strength, my might, my wisdom, my intelligence, my hard work, whatever you may say, made me all this wealth. And Moshe Rabbeinu finishes with such a powerful line. And he says, no, remember it's God. Almighty God, your Lord. It's God who gives you the strength to be successful in life in order to fulfill and establish this covenant that he swore to your forefathers. You know why you're successful? You know why you're blessed? Because God gave you the ability. Yeah, you made a lot of money. You were very successful. But who gave you the intelligence? Who gave you the, the, the skills? Who gave you the strength? Who gave you the stamina? Who gave you everything? It's God, because he's fulfilling his covenant to your forefathers. So it's in the merit of your forefathers and the blessings of God. And don't become arrogant. Remain humble. You know, I was at a retreat this weekend. And there was a certain wealthy couple, renowned philanthropist, they made a donation of $600,000 to this organization. And they were given a plaque, an award. And the wife spoke and she said, you know, it's not our money that we're giving to charity. It's Hashem's money. Hashem gave it to us. And if we don't do with it what we're supposed to do, Hashem will give it to someone else. It was so clear to her that God blessed them with this wealth and they have a mission to take care of uh, other people and support other causes and give charity. And, and if we don't do what we're supposed to do, God won't trust us with this wealth. He'll give it to someone else just like he gave it to us. That's the message of Moshe Rabbeinu. It's God who gives you the ability to be successful. And it's so counterintuitive because you think, oh, the person who's wealthy and successful, of course they'll be grateful to God. He says, no. Sometimes it's easier to be grateful. You know, the person who goes through challenges in life, they sometimes have more gratitude because they appreciate everything they have because they went through so many challenges. But the person who has it good and everything's going well for them and they don't have challenges, and then they start taking all the credit for themselves. How many times have you heard the expression, I'm a self-made man, or he's a self-made man. Self-made, really? Did you create yourself? Did you create your IQ? Did you create your EQ? Did you create your skill sets, your talents, your... Whatever you have is all from Hashem. You're just a vessel. You're just a vehicle. You are a, a conduit for infinite consciousness, which is God. But it's not you. Remain humble. Now, why do people have trouble saying, God, you gave it to me? Because people want to take the credit for themselves. You see, if you say, thank you, God, the word in Hebrew for modem means thank you, but also means to admit. You're acknowledging that everything you have is from Hashem. People don't like to repay debts, right? Why? Because I have to acknowledge I owe somebody something. Saying thank you is acknowledging that God gave you what you have. It's repaying a debt, a debt of gratitude. That's why people use the term, a debt of gratitude. Nobody likes debt, right? So therefore, people don't want to say thank you. And it's not just to Hashem, it's to our fellow man, right? That's why saying thank you could be difficult sometimes for people. But King David says the best in the book of Psalms where he says, Tov lahodot l'ashem. It's good to give thanks to God and to sing to his name. Because the truth is that there's a real human need to express gratitude. Now, a person who doesn't believe in God, you ever hear people say, thank goodness? Well, what does that mean, thank goodness? Who is goodness? So we say, thank God, Baruch Hashem. God is the source of all the goodness. I'm not going to thank the goodness just like I'm not going to thank my computer uh, for doing work. The computer is just a computer. It doesn't have a choice. It's it, Maybe I could thank the inventor of the computer. There's a person who chose to make it. 
Don't thank goodness, thank God. So as a religious person, you have a source to thank for all your blessings. <clears throat> and it's healthy. It's, it's wonderful to express gratitude. And that's why so much of our prayers are filled with gratitude, not because God needs to hear the gratitude, because it makes us better human beings. Just like parents want their children to express gratitude, not because the parents are egotistical and they need to hear their kids thank them, but because what kind of a person just takes and doesn't acknowledge, doesn't appreciate, doesn't show gratitude? So when we say thank you to Hashem, when we're humbling ourselves before God and we're acknowledging the source of our blessings, and that humility, which leads to gratitude in itself, is a tremendous blessing for us to be in a state of humility and, and appreciation. You see, if you're not grateful, you're not appreciating what you have. You're either taking it for granted or you're feeling you're entitled to it or you're deserving of it. And therefore, when you don't get what you want, you're disappointed because I deserve it. As opposed to a person who says, I don't deserve anything. What did I do to deserve to be born? I won the lottery. Hashem made me, created me. So everything I have is gratitude to Hashem. And therefore, my heart is always joyous. Anything I get, I'm grateful. As opposed to being arrogant and feeling you're entitled to everything you get. So that is a major theme of Moshe Rabbeinu. This is like one of the most classic, famous lines of the Torah. The person who says, my might and my strength. Someone said a, self, a self-made man is like a self-hatched chicken. You know, there's no such thing, okay? So therefore, and by the way, the Alta Rebbe and Tanya, and this is based on what Jacob says, when Jacob comes back from the house of Laban with his wives and his children, he says, I feel so small, God, I feel diminished, I feel inadequate because of all the kindness you did to me. The more kindness God does to you, the humbler you become. Not the, Some people, the more they get, the more arrogant they become. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu warns against. But what, what, what Moshe, what, what true quality is the more I get the more humble I become because I say God what did I do to deserve all of this so if you take the sun right the rays of the sun are on the ground very very distant from the sun but the closer you get to the sun let's say in the ball of the fire of the sun there are surely rays of the sun because they're in the sun but you don't see it because the sun overpowers the rays you have to be far away to see the ray so too, the holier a person is, the more righteous they are, the closer they are to the source of life, God, the more humbler they become because they feel Hashem's presence. The more you feel Hashem's blessings in your life, the humble you become, not the, the more arrogant because you know you have a tremendous debt of, of gratitude and also responsibility with all these blessings that God has bestowed upon you. So you never become, Moses was the greatest human being, but also the humblest. Why? Because he said, look what God gave me. All these blessings of being the greatest prophet, God could have bestowed that upon someone else. And he gave it to me. So I'm not better than the next person because that person could have had these same blessings and be uh, the greatest prophet. But furthermore, I have a tremendous responsibility, which humbles me. You know, there's a story told about the sun um, and the wind having a debate in heaven up in the skies. Who's stronger, the wind or the sun? So they decided to put it to a test. So they saw a farmer with a jacket working in the fields. And they said, okay, whoever could get the farmer to take his jacket off first is the winner, the stronger one. So the wind starts blowing 10 miles, 15, 20, 30, 40. And as the wind is getting stronger, the farmer holds onto his jacket tighter and tighter so it doesn't blow off. Finally, the wind gives up and says to the sun, okay, your turn. The sun goes, starts shining, seven degrees, 75, 80, 85. This farmer is schwitzing by 95 100 degrees, the farmer takes off his jacket and throws it on the ground. And the sun says, you see, I won. I'm stronger than the wind. All the blowing of the wind couldn't get the jacket off, but the sun's heat got him to take it off. And this is really a metaphor. When the winds of persecution blew throughout Jewish history, Jews didn't take off their Jewish garb. They held on even tighter with self-sacrifice and determination and strength. But when the wind, but when the sun of sunshine of prosperity of uh abundance of freedom shine many jews threw off their jewish garb their talos their tefillin their kippah 
And it's a fascinating thing that Moshe Rabbeinu predicted this. He says, when times are good, that's the big challenge. The challenge is not during difficult times. Jews remain Jewish through persecution and suffering and poverty. It's the American dream and the abundance and the freedoms that we have today that for many has been their downfall because they got so caught up in all of this uh, prosperity and abundance that they forgot God, just like Moshe Rabbeinu predicts very, very, very clearly in this uh, Torah portion. Um, Moshe Rabbeinu, again, is reviewing many of the uh, incidents uh, that transpired throughout the desert. But I want to look at a very famous verse in this week's Torah portion. And there are so many famous verses. But he says the following. He says, And now, O Israel, what does Hashem your God ask of you? Only to fear Hashem your God, to go in His ways, to love Him, to serve Him, your God, with all your heart, with all your might, to observe His commandments and His decrees. And the question that the Talmud wants to know is, Moses starts by saying, And what is God asking for you? as though it's something small. And then he lists a whole list of, a laundry list of very difficult things, like go in his ways, love him, uh, all your heart with all your soul, observe his commandments, his decrees. Why does that sound like it's a small thing to ask for? So the Talmud, believe it or not, says Moses that the answer is that to Moses this was considered small. But the question is, what do you mean? Moses knows his audience. He's not talking to himself. He's talking to the Jewish people. So how could he minimize all of these difficult requests by saying, what's God asking for you? So Hasidut and Alter Rebbe says that it's because everyone has a spark of Moses in them. Part of our soul has a spark of the soul of Moses. So if we tap into that element of our Moses' soul inside of us, <coughs> we'll find all these things easy. But there's another famous Talmudic answer, that what is God asking from you? Ma. Now the word ma, this goes back to gratitude, could also be pronounced mea, which means a hundred. If you add a letter aleph, which is a silent letter, you have the word mea. God is asking from you one hundred. And here we have a famous tradition that we're expected to make one hundred blessings to God a day. And you may think that's a lot, but we do that because Damida is 18 blessings. is actually a 19, so that's 19. Three times 19, right away you're at 57. Then you listen to the repetition of the two Amidas, morning and afternoon. That's another 36, because when you say Amen, it's as though you're making a blessing. So you're ready now up to 90-something blessings, right? 93 blessings. And then every time you eat food, because you don't just make blessings... Uh, there's the grace after meals, which is in this week's Torah portion, has multiple blessings, but every time you put food in your mouth, you make a blessing. And throughout the day, there are many blessings. We make blessings when we wash our hands. We make blessings when we come out of the restroom. We make blessings, you know, all different types of unique blessings we make on special occasions. Uh, when we hear thunder, when we hear lightning, we see lightning, when we... Uh, when we uh, uh, have a shechiano, some new experience. When we do a mitzvah, we put on our tefillin, we have a blessing. If we uh, put up a mezuzah, we have a blessing. We put on our tzitzit, there's a blessing. So there's many categories of blessings. And over the day, we should give a hundred points of gratitude. And once you do that, if you're constantly expressing gratitude to Hashem for the your material blessings, for, you know, like I said, even being able to use the facilities and your body is functioning. You acknowledge that with a blessing. So there are many blessings throughout the prayers as well, uh, before the Shema and so on and so forth. And therefore, um, what Hashem is asking us to do is make 100 blessings a day. That's the way it's interpreted. Now, we do have the second paragraph of the Shema in today's Torah portion. And you may say, what's the difference? What's the difference between the first paragraph and the second paragraph? It's If you read it, it's almost identical. Now, there is reward and punishment in the second paragraph. That's not in the first, but the commandments are all repeated. You should love the Lord your God, all your heart, your might, all your soul. You should study Torah. You should teach it to your children. 
One fundamental difference is that the first paragraph is all in the singular. The second paragraph is all in the plural, which means that first and foremost, you have to keep the commandments. But then you have an obligation to teach it to others, to inspire uh, others' communal responsibility. We all know that when we got to Torah, we said, Na we will do and we will obey. It's a communal responsibility. So that's number one. Um, but beyond that, uh, the second paragraph concludes with a very powerful verse. It says, if you do this, Moses says, you'll prolong your days and the days of your children in the land that Hashem has given to them. If you want to merit to stay in the land of Israel, Israel is the holy land. You have to be deserving and worthy to be able to live there. If you want your days to be lengthened in the land of Israel, do all of the above. If not, you will be exiled. And I just want to point out something that was pointed out to me. When it says, your days will be long, it's two things. First of all, the word yimechem, your days, if you do the numerical value of the word yimechem, it's uh, yud mem yud chaf mem, 10, 40, 10, 20, and 40. The letters equal 120, which is interesting. But it also says, it doesn't say your years will be uh, long. It says your days will be long. So there's long years and there's long days. What does that mean? What it means to say is that it's not enough to have a long life. You want each day of your life to be a long day. I heard a story. This guy goes to his doctor tragically and... Um, doctor diagnoses him he has a terrible illness and he says unfortunately you have three months to live and the guy says thank you very much he says why are you thanking me he said because I always live as though today is the last day of my life and now you told me I have three months to live so there's a famous story in the Talmud there was a Rabbi Eliezer he said to his students God always accepts the Shuvah so you could sin just repent one day before you die and then you'll be forgiven for all your sins. So the student said, well, how do you know when's the day before you're going to die? He says, that's the point. Live every day as though it's your last day. So making all the days of your life long. And then, of course, a long life quantitatively, not just qualitatively. It doesn't say your year should be long. It means your days should be long. That's the blessing. Now, I just want to point out that in the Shema, in the second paragraph, it talks about the tefillin. It talks about studying Torah. And it's always in the plural. You shall bind it as a nation. You should teach it to your children as a nation. But then it says, when you sit in the house, when you go on the way, when you go to sleep and when you arise. It doesn't say when in the plural, when you are all sitting in your houses or all going on the way. It transitions from plural, you should teach it to your children, to singular when you sit in the house. And the answer is that, yes, you may have a school that educates all the children as it's commanded, not just to teach your children, all the children. But each individual parent has to set the personal example for their children. So it's how you sit in the house, how you go on the way, and so on and so forth. There's another very famous verse in this week's Torah portion that's very relevant with everything that's going on in Israel, of course. The verse says, that the land of Israel is a land, Moshe says, that God is always inquiring about the land of Israel. God is always observing and supervising and seeking out the land of Israel. And here's the words. It's a land that tamed in Hashem lekechaba. The eyes of Hashem, your God, are always upon it from the beginning of the year to year's end. So God is always watching the land of Israel. Remember, there's a story about a great tzaddik who, whenever he would go on a bus or in a car, he would open up a sefer and study Torah. He would not waste his time. When he came to Israel on a trip, he would sit there and look out the window. He wouldn't read his book, his holy teachings of Torah. And they said, you always study Torah in the car or on the bus. Why are you looking out the window and not studying? And he said, because this is the land that God is always watching. The eyes of God are always upon it. So God's eyes are upon it. Should, should my eyes not be upon it? So the land of Israel has a very special status and a holiness to it. However, there's another idea that the Rebbe explains, and he says as follows. He says, it doesn't, it says God's eyes are upon the land of Israel from the beginning of the year till the end of the year. 
So the Alter Rebbe said, it should have just said that God's eyes are upon the land of Israel forever. Lo Olam. Because it says from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, well, the end of the year starts the new year, right? You have the last day of the year, and then the new year begins again. So why does it have to say from the beginning of the year to the end of the year? And here the Alter Rebbe has a very famous idea that every year there's a new light, a new aura that enters into the world. And therefore, it doesn't say forever. It says from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, because when a new year begins, a new heavenly light that never entered into the world from the beginning of creation. You know, yesterday was Tuba Av. Tuba Av is two weeks before Rosh Chodesh Elul. Rosh Chodesh Elul is when we start wishing each other a sweet new year. It says in Jewish law, you could already start from yesterday because we're two weeks away, you know, from Elul. So we're looking forward to another Rosh Hashanah. You may say, what's the difference? We had Rosh Hashanah last year, the year before, it's just another new year. It's not just an anniversary, you see. It's each year a new light of godliness enters into the world that the world never received before. So we're welcoming that new light. And it says in Chassidus specifically, when you blow the shofar, that's when the new light enters in. But um, it's like a staircase. You know, if you have a stair, a spiral staircase and you're going up, you always come back to the same point in the staircase, but you're one floor higher. Every year of our lives, every Rosh Hashanah, we go through the same cycle of the year, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot and Purim and Pesach and Hanukkah, right? And you may say, oh, it's just same old, same old. But it's not, because each year is on a higher level, and that's the truth in our lives. We're supposed to be growing in our lives, so that every year we're on a higher station within that, we're in the same place. It's, it's your birthday, it's your anniversary, it's whatever occasion it is, but on a one rung higher than you were before because your this new light is always entering into the world, raising you up higher and higher. Um, I want to show you another beautiful verse. It says, because I'm uh, Moshe says to Jewish people, that God says, I'm the Lord your God, uh, who's mighty and awesome, right? And I don't show favoritism, and I don't accept a bribe. But I carry out the judgment of the orphan and the widow and loves the proselyte to give them bread and garment. So the question is, why does, why does it have to say that God doesn't accept a bribe? You know, what, are you going to go give God a check? Are you going to give him money? What are you going to do? So the answer is, you may think, oh, God loves the widow and the orphan and the stranger to give them clothing and food. And you should love the stranger, God says. So therefore, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'll bribe God. I'll do, I'll sin, I'll steal, whatever. But then I'll bribe God to wash away my sins. What will I do? I'll give money to the poor, to the widow, to the orphan, because God said he loves them and cares about them. And that's my way of bribing God. So he says, no. Yes, there's a commandment to care for the widow and the orphan and the downtrodden and the stranger. But don't think that that is going to absolve you, that that is somehow going to... Um, be able to bribe God. You can bribe God uh, and be absolved from any of your sins uh, that that you committed, just even if you went and help, helped the poor and the needy. Another beautiful thought in this week's Torah portion is, listen to this verse. This is chapter 11, verse 10. Moshe says, the land you're coming to, to inherit, is not like the land of Egypt that you left. Why? Because there you uh, you planted your seeds, and the water was uh, irrigated on foot, like a vegetable garden. But the land to which you cross over to possess it, the land of mountains and valleys, from the rain of the heaven, it will drink water. So Egypt had the Nile River. The water came and irrigated the fields. All you had to do was plant in like a vegetable garden. Everything was irrigated. But the land of Israel, the water comes from heavens now you may think that's a negative thing right what do you mean in egypt all i had to do was plant i was guaranteed things would grow why because the water from the nile always fertilized and uh, watered the garden but in israel i have to get the water from heaven from the rain and sometimes it doesn't rain and there could be a drought and there could be a famine so why is this a blessing and the answer is you know when you go to the story of uh, Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge. What happens? God says to the snake, you're going to eat, you're going to crawl on your belly and you're going to eat dirt. And that's going to be your curse. 
So someone said, why is that a curse? You know, we as human beings, we have to work hard to make a living and pray for success, to support ourselves. The snake is uh, on his belly, and he always, you will eat dirt, you will eat dust, you will eat uh, uh, earth all the days of your life. Dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Well, there's always the dust available for the snake. He has a constant supply, a packed refrigerator, a pantry full of food. Wherever he goes, there's food, there's plenty of dust. So maybe the snake got a good, but the answer is at the end of the day, you're still a snake and you're eating dust. Why? Because what God is saying is, I don't want to have a relationship with you. Here's your dust. Here's your food. Don't, don't go on your belly. Look at the ground. Don't even look up. You see, in Egypt, you could forget about God because you don't have to look up to heaven. The water comes from the Nile. But now in Israel, you have to look up to the heaven, not down to the Nile, but up to the heaven, and know that your rain is dependent on God. And that's why the Shema says, if you keep the commandments, I will send the rain in its time, and you'll be, everything will grow, and you'll have abund abundance. But knowing you're in a relationship with God and you're dependent on God, that's a blessing. You know, the man in heaven fell every day why couldn't god send a week supply one week at a time why daily and the answer is that every day you should realize you're dependent on hashem and every day appreciate that god gave me my sustenance and really it's not just every day it's every moment every time we breathe call Shammai, praise god with every breath because every breath is god's oxygen keeping me alive so that is not you know there's like that story about this kid who went off to college and his olden days before credit cards, his father would send him a monthly check in the mail. But his kid would never call, he would never write. So one time the father sent a, a, a letter, and how are you doing in school? How's everything? And enclosed, find your check for the month allowance. But there was no check in the mail. So sure enough, the next day, the kid calls his father, Dad, how are you? How's it going? By the way, the check wasn't in the mail. Human nature is that sometimes when the check is in the mail, we don't bother calling our father. We don't call Hashem. We don't reach out. We don't pray. But when the check is not in the mail, God forbid something's not going well, suddenly we come running to the synagogue and we pray and we turn to Hashem. But that's not the way it should be. Every day we should thank Hashem. I and mean, that's what we do thank Hashem every day. Because even though I have a, a refrigerator full of food, and a pantry full of food. I know when I just ate my meal, Hashem gave me that food. So I do the grace after meals as it's stipulated in this week's Torah portion. And that goes back to the constant gratitude, which we know uh, is so essential to uh, being a happy human being, showing gratitude, expressing gratitude, having appreciation. Someone's pointed out to me that the word appreciation means gratitude, but also appreciates means it's something increased in value. It appreciated, right? So. The truth is, what is the value of something? There are a lot of people that have a lot of blessings, but they don't value it. They don't appreciate it. Because they don't appreciate it, it has no value, no appreciation. They don't derive real joy from it because they take it for granted. More than that, maybe they feel they're entitled to even more. So instead of being happy, they're saying, why don't I have as much as the next guy who has more than me? As opposed to the way a Jew lives, everything they have, they're grateful. You don't take a sip of water. Simple thing like water without showing gratitude. God, you made everything. You don't go to the bathroom without coming out and saying, God, I appreciate that everything's working well and I could relieve myself. What a blessing, right? And it's like sucking the 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 juice out of the you know out of the bone, of the marrow of the bone, right? We try to derive as much gratitude from everything to express as much gratitude because sometimes. Until you verbalize it and say, thank you, Hashem. You know, there's a very popular song today. I did it, I, I, I thank you, Hashem. I did it, I, I, it's a nice song. And it's a beautiful song. And the message is, say thank you. It's so beautiful to say thank you. It, it makes you happier. It makes you acknowledge the source of your blessings. You realize you're not alone in this world. Hashem is taking care of you. He's providing for you. And... That's a big part of Moshe Rabbeinu's message. Don't take things for granted. Don't think it's your success you're doing. Realize it's Hashem that gives you that strength, that gives you that ability, and be grateful for everything that you have. So thank you all for joining and wishing everyone a beautiful day and hope to see you all soon. Shalom, shalom.